Um, but we are starting a brand new series today um, called What's Next? Um, and we're going to look at uh, what's next in the life of the, the Israelites. Uh, we saw them last week. They kind of got led right to the edge of the promised land. Um, so we're going to look at what's next for them. Uh, we're going to talk about what's next in, in your life and how that plays out for you as individuals. Um, and over the course of the next several weeks, we're going to talk about what's next in, in the life of the church. Um, and, and I'm excited about that. Several things are coming up. If you uh, saw the video of, of Todd's announcements, uh, with Grief Share coming up, um, our next set of next classes um, coming up. And again, I want to encourage us that I, I would like everyone um, in the congregation to go through that at some point. Because um, this really would get us all on the same page of where we're heading and, and what we're doing and really what God wants next uh, for your life. Because one of the things that I know um, is that we all have a next step. No, no, matter, no matter how long we've been in church, no matter how long that we've, um, and maybe, maybe this is your first week. That I've never been to church in my life, today is, is my first week, you have a next step. Maybe you've been here 50, 60, 70, maybe even 80 years you have a next step. And I love one of the stories that we got to read in, in the Bible this week um, that was about Caleb. Um, you know, Caleb was one of the, the 12 uh, that went to spy out Canaan. The 10 were bad, two were good. Joshua and Caleb were the good ones. Um, and, and at 40 years old, that's when he was sent out to spy out the land. And we read about him again, and this way it says he's 85 years old now. 85. Caleb looks at Joshua and said, hey, God gave me that land. I'm going to go take it right now. 85. You know, so often what happens is we get into the church world. We get into to a, uh, a routine. We get into this is church that I've, I've done my part. I served for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, whatever. I've served in the church. I've done my spot. I've done it all. We'll leave it up to these younger guys. And listen, some of you older folks, God still has next steps for you. And there's some land that he still wants you to take. And there's no excuse to say, I'm too old. God wants you to take that next step, whatever it may be. And I just believe we all have it. And so we left the Israelites right on the edge of the promised land. And Moses wasn't going to go in and, and Joshua was going to become the leader. And Joshua is one of my favorite books um, in, in the Bible, um, partly because that, that's my name. Um, But I kind of think that Joshua was, was a little bit timid and a little bit scared when he's taking over leadership of the people. Because the first time God calls him and says, hey, you're going to be the next one in the book of Deuteronomy, it says over and over again, do not be afraid, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, be strong and courageous. In fact, Joshua is told more than anyone else in all of Scripture, he's told, do not be afraid, be strong and courageous. So I think that, that, that when Joshua is called by God, I think he's scared to death. He's marched through um, all of the, this time with Moses. He's seen how these people were. They were complaining, they were fighting, they were arguing all the time. And he's thinking, all right, God, you want me to lead them next? Moses got so frustrated with him that, that he wasn't even allowed to go into the promised land. And now I'm going to be in charge. And over and over again, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. In fact, the verse that, that Gala read earlier, uh, again, as Joshua is beginning, over and over again, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Read the words of the Lord. Put them on in your heart. Meditate them. Keep them on your lips. And you'll be strong, or you'll be prosperous, you'll be successful. So saying, Joshua, just take the next step. But there was a reason God was telling them that, because it wasn't going to be easy as they proceeded into the promised land. They were going to see God do some great things. They were going to see God do some good things through them. But they were going to start this cycle that would be part of their history and really part of our life for a long time. It's what I've called the human cycle, and it's in uh, your bulletin in, in the back. And it's kind of introduced really this way in the book of Judges, chapter 2. It says, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. 
And they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Harris in the hill country of the Ephra, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. After the whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, so we're through another generation now. Joshua's age group, um, they're they're all dead. It says another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. What happened to the parents? How do you raise kids up in, in this environment, uh, or even in our environment today, that do not know the Lord? Or not? Parents, there's a great responsibility on you to teach your kids what God wants them to do. So often what we do is we leave it up to the church. And listen, we're here for you. We're here to partner with you. We're here to help you. But as parents, your responsibility is to make sure that we don't grow up with a generation who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done in our lives. We're called as parents to lead our families well and to lead them so that they know the Lord and the good things that he's done for us. And here's the cycle. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshiped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Asherahs. In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn to them. They were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who would save them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshiped them. They quickly turned from the ways of their ancestors who had been obedient to the Lord's command. Some of the time. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to the ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors. Following other gods and worshiping them, they refused to give up their evil practices and their stubborn ways. They entered this cycle of, of again, what I call the human cycle. And what was next for them is very often what's next for us in our lives. And it starts, the human cycle starts with sin. And I know that, that sin is, is kind of a, a bad word today. It's, it's not a politically correct word when people don't want to talk about sin. But I'm not afraid to talk about sin. Okay, the Israelites, the, in the Hebrew language, they had actually several words for sin. And they were different describing words. And I, I don't ever try to pronounce Hebrew words because that's just too hard and I'll spit on my wife down there. Like it's, it's a hard language to pronounce. But they had, they had different words for, and we read about them in Leviticus, really, sins, sins that were directly against God, that we, we rebelled, we defied God was, was one of the words. Another word where we get our English word iniquity from was it was a, a sin of um, lust or anger. It was in the moment. Like it was, it was not an intentional sin, but it came from a burning desire in us for something. And it wasn't directly against God. It may have been against someone else or, or against there. And then there was a, just a general word that they used all of the time, which was um, a word that really just simply meant to miss the mark. And that would encompass all of the other sins. And it was the term that they would use for archers, really, like you line up a bow and miss the mark. Sean was talking about his elk hunt. He lined up the bow. He hit the mark. If it had been me, I'd have shot a guy another state over or something. <laughs> I think, like, I, I'm not a weapon guy. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a gun guy. Like, if you take me out to the range, I'm going to miss the mark every time. Um, so I'd ask Scott Somerville, wherever he's at. He's taken me shooting a couple times. And he's like, you're awful. <laughs> and... And, and I am. We miss the mark. And, and when you miss the mark, and when you're hunting, sometimes it's, it's not a, a real big deal. But when we miss the mark with God, it always brings about the same thing. It always separates us from him. It separates us from other people. And, and that's the cycle. That's where it starts in our life. Uh, we... We think that we know better 
than God. Over and over again through the book of, of Judges and the book of 1 Samuel, you'll, you'll see this phrase, one of two phrases appears over and over again. It says, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Who's, whose eyes matter here? It's the eyes of the Lord. It's because we, we live in a culture that is, has taken sin down to, to, well, you can't tell me I'm sinning. You, 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 can't, you can't tell me that what I'm doing is wrong because what's wrong for you might not be wrong for me. And it might be right. We live in a world that wants to say there is no absolute truth. So when we look at sin and when we look at our lives and we look at the direction of our lives, the only eyes that matter are in the eyes of the Lord. And what God says is sin is sin. It doesn't matter how we want to sugarcoat it or, or how we want to justify it. God's the one that defines that. So well, you're not the one. You can't tell me that. I'm not telling you that. God's telling you that. In another word, uh, phrase that's used over and over again, it says, or the Israelites, they did what was right in their own eyes. See, again, it's talking about, about the eyes. See, a lot of people, well, it's, it's right in my own eyes. It doesn't matter. <laughs> what matters is if it's right in the Lord's eyes. And they started this cycle of, of sin in their lives of moving. And, and that cycle always leads to the next place, which is oppression or slavery. You know, over and over again, we're reading that, that the Israelites were handed over to the Canaanites, to the Moabites, to the Midianites, to the Amalekites, to the Ammonites, to the Philistines, to, to over and over again throughout the book of Judges. Now, in fact, 12 times in the book of Judges, they're handed over and they're took into oppression and into slavery all because of their, they, they did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. All because they did what was right in their own eyes that it led to this place of oppression and slavery. 12 times. In the book of Judges. That's before there's kings that even come into place later on. Sin does the same thing in your life. It leads to oppression. Or it leads to slavery. It may be a slave to fear. That we sung about earlier. It may be a slave to an addiction. Maybe a slave to anger. But sin always leads to the same place. You know, Jesus would even talk about that when he said, the thief, he comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the thing, and we look at it from, from our side, say, man, why would they keep doing, going over and over again? Why would they keep doing evil in the eyes of the Lord? Why would they keep doing what was right in their own mind or their own eyes when they know it's going to lead to slavery? Because here's the thing. Sin's fun. I've heard preachers for years say, well, sin's no fun. Like, then you're doing it wrong. Like, if it wasn't fun, honestly, if, if it wasn't fun, no one would do it. If, if the, the consequences of our sin were, were immediate and abrupt every single time, no one would do it. But see, what the enemy does in the culture that we have does is it'll put off sin, the punishment of sin, because it's fun. It's enticing is a word that's used oftentimes in the Scripture, that we're enticed away. Because it's fun. And we so often live for the moment. We live for, for what's fun right now. Not worrying about the future. Not worrying about the slavery that it's leading me to. Or the oppression that's going to happen. So we read the, the book of Judges. And we're like, well, why would they keep going back over and over and over again? Well, it's part of the human cycle that we do the same thing. We go back over and over and over again. But then the next part of the cycle is repentance. Repentance is a, a changing of, of our mind or a changing of our, our actions. It's a literally turning around um, in, our, in our actions and in our mind. And said so they would cry out to God in their affliction. 
They would cry out to God in their distress over and over again. Many times as they, they sinned and led to slavery, then they would always cry out to God in their distress or in their affliction or in their pain. And they would change their ways for a time. That's how good God is. That every time, over and over again in our lives, we have this opportunity to repent, to come back to God. You know, because sin leads to slavery, which the goal ultimately is that it would lead to repentance. That it would lead to a changing of our heart or to a changing of our mind to say, you know what, God, what's right in my eyes may not be right in your eyes. Let's follow your eyes. I want to see with your eyes. I want to, I want to know your thoughts on my life. And then there was always deliverance. But it was never on their own. And this, I love the, the book of Judges as well. There were six major judges throughout. There was 12 total, six major, six minor judges. And you had Othniel, and, and Ehud is one of my favorite judges. Um, Ehud um, had some type of handicap, they say, and it may have just been that he was left-handed. So we know that he was left-handed. Some people say, well, there must have been something wrong with his right hand. But, but in those days, to be left-handed was, was a disability. I don't know how many of you are left-handed in here. Like, I'm not saying you're disabled. Um, but, but, but in that time, it would have been. Like, it would have been considered that for, for some reason. And the people have, have been paying taxes to Eglon, the king. They've been enslaved by this king uh, for uh, several years. Um, I think it's 18 years. Um, at this point, they've been in slavery. They've been in oppression. They're having to give him their money. They're having to, to give him their land. They're giving him all these things. And they cry out and they say, God, send us a deliverer. Send us someone to save us. So this left-handed uh, guy named Ehud straps this sword to his leg. And he goes up to talk to, to the king. And, and this is why people think that he maybe had actually something wrong with his right arm. Because they led him in the presence of the king. By himself. And Ehud takes out this sword and he sticks it into Eglon. And Eglon is a huge man. I love it. And the Bible says that, that he stuck it in so deep that even the, the fat then even covered the handle of it. So you couldn't even tell. Like, that's awesome. <laughs> so he kills the king. He escapes um, out the, um, and I don't even know the, the best way to, to say this without getting in trouble from the elders. Um, escapes out the, the outhouse chute is, is what we'll call it. <laughs> and, I, and every time I read that, I think about um, Shawshank Redemption where he climbed through 500 yards of the phallist. Um, and that's kind of what Ehud did. I, he snuck out that way, and then the king's men are there, and they're saying, hey, wait, he should be out of there, but he should be out of the bathroom by now. Like, he's, the dude's got problems in there. And, and they go in and find him dead, but Ehud had delivered them out of the oppression of the king. He'd killed the king. Then you have Deborah. Uh, a great woman of the Bible that God used in another great story, Jael, um, drives a tent stake through a guy's temple to bring about freedom. Then you got Gideon, who Gideon said, you know what, I'm the weakest of all of, of my tribe. I, I am nothing. And God looks at him and says, hey, mighty warrior, I'm gonna use you to deliver these people. You have Abimelech, you have Jephthah, I mean, then Samson. And if you read the story of Samson, you're thinking, man, that man is a mess. But God used him to deliver his people out of slavery. Because that's part of the cycle. We sin, we, we become uh, oppressed, we become in slavery, we repent. God sent a deliverer. And all of these people in the Old Testament were actually pointing to what Jesus would do for us once and for all. He would set us free forever. And then you have a time where they live in peace and victory. Peace and victory would come. And it would last, the Bible said, until the judge died. But then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. 
and they would start the cycle over and over and over again. And it's the same in our life. So what's next for you is my question. Where are you in this cycle? For some of you, like you're living in sin and I don't need to tell you that, you know. Like you are making bad decisions right now. And, and, and I'll tell you where it'll lead. It'll lead to oppression or slavery. Some of you are there. You're slave to, to an addiction. You're a slave to fear. You're a slave to, to, to relationships that have been destroyed. Like, like you know. For you, your next step would be repentance. When you repent, God will provide a deliverer. He's already done that in Jesus. Some of you, you're living in peace. And that's awesome. My prayer is that you'll stay there and not continue the, the cycle. You know, I talked about Joshua, and I think he was very timid at the beginning because God kept telling him over and over again. Moses would tell him, God would tell him, do not be afraid. Be strong and courageous. And they're getting ready to march into the promised land, and as they get there, the walls of Jericho are before them, and they're huge. And it says, now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or are you for our enemies? That's what we want to know all the time. And then are you for me or are you against me? And that was Joshua. And again, and I think at this point he's timid. I, I think he's scared because he doesn't know what's next. All he knows is that God said, hey, you're going to take this land, but there's huge walls. He'd been in the city before. He'd seen that these people are giants and that they're not to be messed with. Most of them had said, you, they already got too scared and backed out. He said, are you for me or are you against me? He says, neither. He replied, but it's made for the Lord's army, of the army of the Lord I have now come. Then Joshua fell down and faced down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for a servant? Neither. See, a lot of times what we try to do is we say, God, are you for me or are you against me? Like, God, this is the decision I'm going to make. Are you going to be on my side or are you going to be against me? And God's just like, neither, neither. I've got my own side. It's what's right in my eyes that matters. Not your eyes, not their eyes. God's saying, I'm on my own side. So the commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place you're standing is holy. And I love that line because I think really that is what changed Joshua. Because after that, he's the one that's running around telling people, hey, be strong and courageous, don't be afraid. I think that meant so much to him because I think as, as they were traveling through the wilderness, I think time and time again that they sat down and they did what men did. They'd sit around the fire and they'd build a fire. They'd say, hey, Moses, tell us how God called you. Tell us that story again uh, about when you were on the side of the mountain and you saw this burning bush, what happened? And he'd say, well, I approached this bush and it was on fire. And God said, take off your shoes because the place you're standing is holy ground. And he would tell the story then of how he went and approached Pharaoh and God put all of the plagues out there and how God led them through the Red Sea and how God fed them with manna and they were witnessing the quail from the sky. They were witnessing all of the good things that, it, that had happened. But it started with Moses, take off your shoes. So when Joshua heard that, he was face down. And God said, you know, Joshua thought, you know what, it's time for me to go. God's getting ready to do something great through me. And I'm gonna ask you to stand today because I think the same thing is true for you, that God is saying to you that, hey, take off your shoes because the place where you're standing is holy. God wants to do something great through you. Maybe it's to, to bring you out of the slavery and the oppression of sin that you're in right now because of repentance. For some of you, maybe it is to be the deliverer for someone else. God used messed up people all throughout the book of Judges, all throughout the Bible to lead people to peace and to victory. 
And if you're living in peace and victory today, your next step is that you need to be a deliverer for someone else. You need to be the one that carries that message to them. So where are you in the cycle? What, what do you need to repent of? Who could you be the deliverer for? Because God's getting ready to do something great through you. Let's pray. Father God, we are thankful today that you are good to us. That even though all throughout history, really, we've lived in this cycle, even though we know where it leads, God, we still choose to follow our own ways or do what's right in our own eyes. Lord, I thank you for your goodness that when we repent, you always send the deliverer. And we always have a time of peace and victory in our lives. So Father, I pray for whatever decisions need to be made today, whether it's the decision of repentance, whether it's a decision to, to be a deliverer. Lord, I pray that you give us the courage, give us the strength. Because like Joshua, so many times you're telling us, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. God, you want to do great things in and through us. It's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.